Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Eight Questions You Wanted to Ask a Patent Attorney But Were Afraid to Ask. As startups and entrepreneurs develop their ideas, questions of intellectual property are likely to arise. Today's webinar can help you save thousands of dollars by being informed about different options and legalese. First, let's meet our presenters. Greg Keeson serves as the Moore Norman Technology Center Business Development Center Coordinator. Greg's multinational experience and legal relations background spans over 31 years in executive management and business development. As the manager for Moore Norman's award-winning and nationally certified business incubator, Greg has helped develop several companies based on proprietary technologies and inventions that are protected as intellectual property. Registered patent attorney and owner of McCarthy Law Group, Mick McCarthy specializes in intellectual property procurement and com commercialization. With 19 years experience as a licensed practitioner, first as a patent agent and then as a patent attorney, Mick's talent and knowledge are valuable for anyone with the idea or invention that may be commercialized. The McCarthy Law Group practices in all aspects of intellectual property law with extensive experience in a wide range of technologies. We'll now turn the presentation over to Mick and Greg. Please note your questions during the presentation as the presenters will answer them at the end. Greg, Mick, over to you. Well, thank you and uh, welcome to our attendees to our uh, webinar on intellectual property. Uh, I'm Greg Keeson, the uh, manager here at the Business Development Center. Uh, I selected this as the first topic for our webinar series based on the importance to you as the business owner. Um, we have a variety of folks come here looking for assistance from inventors to software developers to people with uh, hard products. And the one thing they all have in common is the need for protection of their intellectual property, be it patents, trademarks, copyrights, etc. And the importance I think can be, can't be overstated because if indeed you fail to properly protect, uh, that is an asset of your business, you're putting the entire company at risk. Uh, I'm joined today, as was mentioned by uh, our introducer uh, by Mick McCarthy. Mick is uh, a member of our advisory board here at the Business Development Center and is active in helping us uh, with clients to solve various issues that relate to their intellectual property. So Mick, let me just start out uh, by asking you for an overview on intellectual property. I know it includes more than just patents, which is our topic for today. And maybe you can expand on that. Well, thank you, Greg, for the opportunity to participate with you in this webinar. I enjoy keeping up with you. You getting get me into a lot of fun things, including this. So let's talk about intellectual property law generally. I like to give a what I call a bucket speech. I literally pull out four buckets and I put them on the table. And the point of the bucket speech is these are four legal areas that are provided for provide for protecting your intellectual property today we're going to concentrate on the first bucket the patent bucket the point is if you don't do something affirmatively to protect your your invention by way of the patent law then it, if it's not in the bucket then it's on the table for other people to enjoy so we're going to we're going to dwell on what what exactly does it take to get something in the packet, patent bucket today doesn't mean the other buckets aren't just as important. We're just not going to have time to, to, to address them. For instance, trademark law is another important area that uh, our clients need to understand how to protect their valuable intellectual property in the trademark area. Another bucket is trade secret law. That which you can keep secret and take reasonable measures to do so, you can protect it under trade secret law, another valuable intellectual property bucket. And then finally, the bucket of copyright law, again, a very important area of law that we need to understand. And don't get me wrong, some types of technology can be covered with, with, within different buckets. A good example would be software technology. Software can certainly be protected under copyright law, but the copyright law would just protect unauthorized copying of the code itself. Whereas if you wanted to protect the idea, what, what the software does, the, the functionality of it, 
you could also patent it. So there's there's an example how one type of technology might might be uh, served by a dual purpose by uh, intellectual property law. Well, Mick, let me pose a question to you that tends to create some confusion amongst the clients that I have come in here to the Business Development Center. Um, it's got to do more with trademarks and copyrights that there there are authorities here in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, particularly through the Secretary of State's office for registration locally here in the state versus the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office or the Library of Congress. Can you just comment relative to, again, the appropriateness and coverage uh, and differences between those two approaches, state versus federal? Certainly, Greg. And, and the answer is very straightforward. State protection is, is very limited and very narrow protection. When you register your business entity with the Secretary of State and you are the first person to use that particular name, then you are you, you begin to build some rights, some common law rights in the use of that mark or that name in commerce. But the strength of that mark is a continuum from that very weak initial position to the other end of the scale would be for us to file in the trademark uh, patent and trademark office for a federal registration of that mark, which if it, if we're successful in getting it through the process, then you, you have a national registration on that mark. And so it really depends on what your business plan is, Greg. If you're gonna run a very small limited operation and only interested in, in the use of the mark locally or regionally, perhaps the state reg uh, registration would be sufficient. In most cases, the computer has made the world very small and people are more interested in protection of that mark regionally, if not nationally. Okay, well, thanks, Mick. Now, let's move on to some uh, specific questions that I have based on, again, inquiries, regular inquiries that I get from uh, clients and customers here at the Business Development Center. Let's start with the, the question just of ownership. Who is the rightful owner of a particular invention and patent rights, and exactly how is that determined if there's a dispute. I know the rules have changed in recent times, and can you explain that to us? Yes, Greg, that's a very important point. If we, if we remember anything from this webinar, let's walk away understanding the difference between inventorship and ownership. A patent application has to be filed in the name of the inventors. That's the law. It's not a popularity contest. It's not a reward program. As we get into the basic parts of a patent, at the end, you find the claims. The claims are the legal description of what that patent does and doesn't cover. If a person ma contributes materially to the subject matter of any one claim uh, in, in conceiving it or reducing it to practice, we have to list that person as an inventor on the patent application. So it becomes very important to you as a business owner, if you are, if you are obtaining patent protection for the, per, for the ben benefits of your company, you want to make sure that you have in your employee agreements an assignment, a contractual assignment of that patent right from the individual inventor to your company. Now we've transferred ownership of that patent from the inventor to your business entity. Now, you mentioned that the rules have changed because and, and, and that's true. March 16th of this year, the final phases of the America Invents Act went into effect. And prior to that, uh, we, we played under a completely different set of rules, which are gone now. Basically, the United States patent law is now in a tune with most of the rest of the world, which recognizes basically the first person, the first owner to file the patent application is going to be recognized by the patent office as the owner of that patent application. Okay. Thanks, Mick. And let me ask a, a follow-up question that, again, tends to be confusing. Be, and again, in this era of electronic information and cross-border activity, uh, people tend to perhaps go fairly quickly from operating in an environment here in the U.S. to crossing the border to Canada, et cetera. Can you just, uh, there might be a thought pattern out there that there's some type of 
reciprocal rights or something uh, once you cross borders. So can you speak to that for just a minute? Really, there's not, Greg. A, a United States patent gives the owner the right to prevent others from making the invention in the United States or using the invention in the United States. So certainly it would protect someone uh, as against some uh, infringer who might make his patented invention in Canada and sell it in the United States. But in order to obtain rights beyond that, in order to obtain rights to prevent others from making or using the invention in a foreign country, now we have to apply for foreign patent protection. Okay, thank you, Mick. Let me, let me move on to a concern that folks have when I first see them who uh, are just generating the, their ideas, uh, haven't really perhaps done some work, much work beyond just the, the initial thought process and are looking for uh, assistance. Their issue is sharing that idea with others during this investigative period. So if I'm an inventor who has something new, we're going to talk about the, the issue of research. What precautions do I need to take to protect that idea in terms of disclosure? And I know confidentiality agreements are used on a regular basis. Are they really enforceable? Very important issues, Greg. And a, and a point of, of, of very high anxiety for, for inventors, especially small companies and individuals who, who haven't played this patent game very much. Nobody commercializes an invention by themselves. They have to have associates. They have to have partnerships. They need people that have expertise that's beyond their own individual expertise. They need manufacturing people. They need marketing people. They need distribution chain people. They need ultimately to reveal this invention but they are concerned with the fact that once the cat gets out of the bag, then they have potentially created some competition. And as I've already mentioned, if somebody beats them to the patent office, now they're in a disadvantageous position in terms of who really owns this patent. And so for those purposes, we're, we're going to talk about different types of patent applications. Uh, there are some strategies that are available that can help but more particularly to your question right now, in terms of confidentiality agreements, yes, they are essential. Yes, they can be enforceable. Unfortunately, what I see, most of them that are used are, for the most part, not. If you go out and Google uh, non-disclosure agreements and, and, and pull up what you'll typically find out there, uh, you'll, you'll usually find agreements that, that, that are unenforceable for, for reasons like uh, too long a term. Uh, courts will typically not enforce a, a confidentiality agreement for anything other than trade secret type information for more than a year or two. I mean, you have a, you have a, you have a certain amount of time uh, during which you have an opportunity to get a patent application on file. And if you choose not to, the court's not going to enforce some agreement as if it were a patent forever or for 20 years or anything like that. The most important advice that I can give in terms of confidentiality agreements is avoid the trap of finding out something was disclosed and then you say it's confidential. Identify beforehand what the confidential information is. And so uh, my, my confidentiality agreements will have a marking provision in it, for instance, Greg. Very simple idea, but it drives the discipline of, in terms of if I am going to give you something that's confidential, it's simply going to be marked confidential. If I tell you something verbally that's confidential that I'm gonna follow it up with some kind of writing that informs you beforehand, of the confidentiality of that information. You've been very helpful over time, Mick, with these confidentiality agreements. And I might mention to the audience, with you as part of our advisory board here, you've uh, provided us with some uh, confidentiality agreements that we use on a regular basis uh, with our clients who are coming in here that do address all of those issues that you had mentioned. Okay, let me, let me move on to the area of research then because as a person is coming up with a new idea there's the issue of determining is it really new is it really different and is it really unique now we're going to take uh, a two-pronged approach on this uh, mick i'm going to turn it over to you relative to 
doing research with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And then we'll talk on the later parts of this particular point at some local resources that are available that the uh, listeners might be able to take advantage of right here in Oklahoma. Okay, Greg. Let me say at the outset, uh, we're, we're just going to touch on the fundamentals of how a person can go and do a cursory search. Uh, I don't do a lot of searches in my office because there are people out there that specialize in that kind of work. I can refer a search to a, to a professional searcher in Washington, D.C. and get a very comprehensive search for just a few hundred dollars. And at the end of the day, if, if you're serious about filing a patent application, a few hundred dollars for a comprehensive patent search is a very good investment because it gives you an idea, a very good idea of, of the same kind of prior art that the examiner is going to see when he examines your patent application. But just to, just to give you an idea of the kind of information that's available out there to you, I'm going to show you a couple of websites. The first of which is USPTO.gov. That's United States Patent and Trademark Office.gov. Now, this is the opening screen of the Patent and Trademark Office. You notice the first tab is Patents. So let's go to Patents, and then the first tab down is Patent Search. And now we have a couple of options here. It says Patent Full Text, and this is Patent Application Full Text. This is a, this is a complete database of all issued patents and all pending patent applications that have been published. If I, file, if I file a patent application for you today, and unless we do something otherwise, and we'll leave the exceptions off the, off the table for right now, but normally if we, file, if we file an application today, if that application doesn't issue as a patent within 18 months, then the patent office is going to publish it so that other people can see what you're up to. They can see the kind of applications that you are, um, that you have on file. So, I'm going to show you an example under the patents, but for everything that we do in the patent group, we'd want to do the same kind of searching in, in the applications as well, because it's two different databases. But if I select the patent office database, now I get some, some opportunities for searching a different way. If I know the patent number directly, I can just plug in the patent number and go get that patent. But let's say we're searching an, an invention, and let's just make up an invention. Let's say, for instance, uh, our client has, has an idea for an improved Christmas tree holder. You know the red stands with the the red bowl with the three green legs on it that holds a bowl of water. Well, that doesn't that doesn't do much to keep the tree fresh long enough for the Christmas season. They tend to get dry and brittle. So he's got an idea of putting in that red bowl a, a, a rubber boot that compresses around the tree, and he can he can pump some water into that boot and pressurize that boot with some water and force some hydration into that tree. And the idea of keeping it uh, green and, and and not so brittle. Now. I'm, going to sh I'm, going to, I'm first going to show you a, a way of doing a very cursory search. This is just simply a keyword in context search. It's not a very comprehensive way, but it, but it is a way of kind of finding a, 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 a few patents that might be related to, to your invention. And so in this query box, let's, let's say, for instance, we want all patents that have the word tree and water in them. And let's see what happens. Oh my goodness, there's 29,529 patents that have both the word tree and water. And we probably don't have enough time to comb through all of those patents. That's correct. And so let's go, let's go back and, and, and narrow that search a little bit. You see, these are all search terms that allow us to narrow the scope of the search. For instance, TTL would narrow it to all patents that have just those words in the title. So if I were to amend that search, I would say TTL slash, and then I'll put a parenthesis around both tree and water in the title. Let's see what that does. From 29,000 Ah, we're down to 37. So that narrowed the search quite a bit. And so if we look at 
some of these titles, fault tree analysis system for the, see that has nothing to do with our invention, but it does have the same tree protection and water saving apparatus, distributed temp. So here, here we go, adjustable high water capacity tree stand. There's something that would be very interesting, wouldn't it? And so we would want to take a look at that patent and, and, and we'll do that in a minute. But let me show you the, the more uh, thorough way of searching. Rather than this keyword in context, I want our, our, our clients to also be aware of the, the way that, it, that a patent examiner actually <clears throat> searches for these patents. You'll see an opportunity here to search by class. You see all technology is eventually put into some class and subclass by the technology. It's a hierarchical listing of all technology. And so all of these kind of devices are going to be classified within one or more of the same classes. And so I'm going to, I'm going to select this USPC class tab. And now here is a complete listing of that hierarchical uh, classification. And what I can do now that I have this listing is I can search it. So I'm going to search for the term tree. And guess what? It's not found in any of these classes. So I need to go broader. Tree is a little too specific. Let's try what's, what's a, a tree more broadly is a plant, for instance. Ah, here we go. Our first category is plant husbandry. Seems like that might be a good general categorization. Uh, there's, there's, there's seven total, you see. The next one would be power plants. Obviously, I'm not interested in that. Planting, technology dealing with planting, eh, not so much. Let's go back to plant husbandry, and we can see within that broad category of plant husbandry, we can see, now here's all the subcategories. And so I'm going to look at all these subcategories, and I'm going to find one that maybe it's most likely connected to my technology. And as I, ah, look here, injection, method or apparatus. That sounds very familiar. Uh, let's, let's, let's look at all the patents that are in this category. Here we go. And the, the point that I want to make to you, uh, for instance, here's a Christmas tree self-watering apparatus. That sounds very, very much like what um, we saw before. But the point here is, I know, for instance, I, I just happen to know this particular patent right here, 6405480. It also is a patent that's very, very much related to what I'm interested in. But yet the, uh, the patent drafter in this case t opted to use language that doesn't have the word tree or water. He calls it a fluid injection apparatus and method. Now, when it comes to looking at a patent, we can use we can use the patent office website. If I select that patent, now I get some information. I get an abstract. I can read a kind of an executive summary of what this invention is. It's a fluid injection apparatus and associated method for supplying a pressurized fluid to a permeable portion of a tree. Spot on. That's what I'm looking for. So I want to know if my invention has any improvements that's different from this invention. Now I can, I can select images within the patent office website and go look at that but the patent office website doesn't have a very good uh, browser. Uh, I prefer to use Google patents. And so if we open that window, I can go to Google, Google patents. And what, what, what Google does for me is give the entire patent as, and that patent number was 6405480. It gives me the entire patent as one PDF file, whereas the patent office gives me one page at a time as a PDF file. So here I'm able to see the entire patent and you can see there is, there is the invention that is very similar to what, what I'm inventing. And so I wanna look through these drawings. I wanna understand this invention from, from, from the perspective of what the drawings show. And then I wanna read if it, if it looks like something that, that's related to my invention, then I want to read the technical description of the invention. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, I want to understand what this inventor has actually claimed. You see this claim one? This is his claim to his patent. And so I want to make sure that my invention doesn't infringe his patent. If my invention has each and everything in any one of his claims, then we might have an infringement issue. 
Also, Mick, uh, within that file and listed on the patent is going to be the date of issue. Yes. Which, of course, could be important. And maybe just remind the listeners, what what is the period of your rights yes. once you have an issued patent? Absolutely, Greg. This patent issued June 18th of 2002. This patent was filed on May 30th of 2001. So as long as that inventor continues to pay what are called maintenance fees, there are three maintenance fees that are required during the term of a patent, which is 20 years from the date that the application was filed. So this, this, app, this patent will be uh, enforceable for until May 30th of 2021, so long as those issue fees are paid. Maintenance fees are paid. I'm sorry, not issue fees, maintenance fees. And what happens if one skips the maintenance fees? Does it become listed as abandoned or what? It's yes, yes. If you if you if if you decide not to pay a maintenance fee, then the term of that patent is 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 over, and it's now anybody can practice it. It's in the public domain. Okay, thank you, Mick. Uh, let me just mention for the listeners that there is a wonderful, very unique service available here in the state of Oklahoma at the Inventors Assistance Service, which is a state-sponsored. Uh, organization that operates up at uh, OSU in Stillwater. The uh, contact information relative to email is listed on the slide, but I have some info. So to go back and start over right when you were just saying, thank you, Mick, and now mm -hmm. with what you were just saying for releasing. Can I just switch the screen back? Switch screens back. Oh, and so okay. Make sure we're sure, back sure. on, on sure. the screen. Okay, you ready? Can mute your computer because I know he's trying to mute. Thank you, Mick. Let me also mention for the listeners that there is a wonderful, unique service available here in the state of Oklahoma for those of you who uh, are. We're not on the right slide. Oops. We're not on the right slide. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, okay. you're, you're still back on how to research okay, the research. resistance stuff. This okay, is kind of less than that. No, no problem. Right. Ready? Good. Thank you, Mick. Let me mention also for the listeners that there is a wonderful, unique service available here in the state of Oklahoma uh, called the Inventors Assistance Service. It's uh, publicly funded. Uh, it's up at uh, OSU in Stillwater. The contact information relative to email addresses is listed on your slide, but let me give you a phone number, and I'd ask you to just jot this down. It's area code 405 744 2932. I'm going to repeat that. 405 744 2932. The name of the patent librarian up there in Stillwater is Suzanne Reinman. And I would advise you to, you need to make an appointment to see her because it's wonderful for you to go up there and the resources available. And if she's not available to attend to your needs when you get there, it could be a wasted trip. Uh, their job is to assist in exactly what Mick was uh, pointing out here in providing research information and providing you with information to help you make a decision on how to proceed and what prior art is out there relative to previously issued patents. Let me move on then, Mick, to the, the next question that often comes up from the viewpoint of the inventor is as the inventor is proceeding with the inventive process, what exactly should he or she be doing in terms of procedures to properly document the idea? Ah, good question, Greg. I want our client to act as if they're ultimately going to have to prove that they invented this, this that they, they originally conceived and, and, and invented this invention before anybody else did in a court of law. They need that kind of bulletproof evidence. And so I want them to begin today, uh, get a journal, a hardbound journal, one that you cannot easily, you know, slip pages in and out, make entries in it every day, even if you don't do anything, even if you do, just make an entry and say, you know, uh, show me, give, be able to produce for me documentation that's dated, uh, that's continuous, that shows a continuous effort at bringing this um, 
invention to from an idea to an invention. And by that, I mean, uh, the, the, the process is working out all the details, right? We have to know, we ultimately have to be able to explain how to make this technology and how to use the technology. And, and that's what they're struggling through is, is, is determining how to bring this technology to the marketplace at a, at a price point that the, that the market will bear. And that's the challenge. Uh, we want to see lists of conversations with, the, with who they, you know, who they had conversations with and when and what was discussed. All of that kind of evidence needs to be documented and so that we can, if need be, prove that they were the first person to conceive this. Now, from a strategy standpoint, um, we, we want to determine up front if, if there's any possibility that they want to protect this technology with a patent then the current advice is to file provisional patent applications early and often. If there are milestones to inventing, you, you reach a certain point where you're 60% there and you've got a, enough of a nugget of an idea that it's worth protecting. And so we want to file a provisional patent application. Now, if you ultimately you say to me, there's no way I'm ever going to patent this, then under the current laws that we discussed earlier, where the first you know, the first person to get to the patent applicate to the patent office is is recognized as the patent holder. If you if you tell me without a doubt that you're never going to file a patent application, then it can actually be to your advantage to disclose the information, get it out there, and prevent other people from getting a patent. But um, that's a, that's a tough one to decide because all too often you may decide that early on, and then when when the technology uh, you know, matures, somebody comes along and says, ah, if we could just get a patent, I might be interested in being an investor. And so you don't want to just jump to that conclusion too quickly. Exactly. Thank you, Mick. Let me pose a question then relative to different types of patents. Uh, I've been exposed over time to design patents, utility patents. As an inventor, how do I know which one is right for me? What's the difference? Well, the the basic two choices for protecting technology is a utility patent and a design patent. A utility patent does protects just that. It protects the utility of this invention, what it does, the function, its purpose, what, what problem it solves and the way that it solves it, the structure, uh, that type of thing. A design patent likewise protects just that, the design, the aesthetically pleasing aspects of what this thing is. Tennis shoes are, are a good example of things that get design patents. I recently got a design patent for someone who came up with a unique way of making some, some uh, lawn furniture out of a you know, particularly unusual uh, construction method. And they made basically the financial decision that uh, the design patent was enough because I can get a design patent application on file for a few hundred dollars, whereas to, to put together the utility application like we saw on the Christmas tree water. It's a pretty complex document. We have to put, a, put together a, not only a set of drawings, but we have to put together a technical draw, a, a technical description of the invention as well as those all important claims. And so that's ultimately the, the driving decision often is, is the economics of the situation. How important is it that I, that I get patent protection on the function of this device as opposed to just the design? Okay, good advice, Mike. Thank you. Let me then move on to ask you to expand on an issue that you, you started to mention before in your explanation called the provisional ap applications. Many times the folks that I see coming into our center here, again, are very unsure about the commercial viability of the idea. Uh, don't have substantial funding to start with, need to do some market testing, yet they want to take appropriate measures to protect the idea. And I understand one of the ways to do that is with a provisional application. Can you expand on the uh, advantages and the rules? Absolutely. For my golfing friends, you'll understand a provisional application is the same as a provisional shot. Uh, I, I take it just in case I need it. And that's, that's what we're doing with a provisional patent application is we're filing an application with the office just in case we decide we're going to need something to rely on. 
a provisional patent application in and of itself becomes nothing. Uh, the, the purpose for a provisional patent application, Greg, is to basically hold you a date. If I file a provisional application for you today, we take a stack of information that basically, to the, to the extent that we know as of today, is a detailed description of how to make and use your invention. And that can be in a written description, that can be in photographs, that can be on rough sketches, whatever it takes. There are no formal requirements. Just give me a stack of stuff that to the best of our ability describes how to make and how to use your invention. We file that today. Then we get up to one year to rely on the technical disclosure in that stack of stuff uh, as a earlier filing date if we decide within that one year period of time to, to follow up and file a utility patent application. So if we file the utility today, another benefit is once we have a provisional application on file or, or a utility, either one, then we get to put patent pending on everything. You cannot put patent pending on your stuff unless you've got a patent application on file one, one sort or the other. A provisional is, is sufficient. So by, by putting a provisional application on file, which is very inexpensive as compared to the utility application, you, you get a patent pending status and then you go about your business plan. You start, you start uh, executing. If you come back to me in December and you say, man, Mick, we're going great guns. We want to go ahead and file that utility application. The advantage then is if I put that utility application together for you in December, let's say we wrap it up and get it done by January of next year, for everything that, that we disclosed in that earlier filed provisional application, we get to claim the earlier filing date of the provisional date, not the January next year date. So anybody else that may have tried to beat us to the patent office in the interim between now and then, we got an earlier filing date than them. Okay. Well, let me ask you to expand on a concept that I've heard a great deal over the years in terms of the provisional application. There's always been the comment that they can be done on the back of a napkin, that they're very informal, which makes, which tends to, I think, encourage people to, quote, do them themselves and just file them in a, on a fairly informal basis without perhaps advice of counsel in terms of review. Can you comment on that in terms of your experience? Yes. I can say unequivocally that 99.99% of all the provisionals I've seen, including those that were assisted with LegalZoom.com, are pretty worthless because they tend to dwell on the advantages of this invention, the benefits of this invention, how, how do you, the, 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 the technical requirements are or the legal requirements, I'm sorry, are that we have to be able to disclose how to make the invention and how to use the invention. And it's, and it's paramount that we get those kind of technical details in the provisional because ultimately if we are going to file a utility patent application, the subject matter of any claim in that utility application, if we can't find support for it in the provisional, it doesn't get the benefit of the earlier filed provisional. So all those little technical details is what we have to have in the, in the provisional. And that reinforces my point earlier to file early and often. The, the advice now, as of March 16th of this year, with the new first to file uh, U.S. patent law, is file that first provisional when you're 60% there. And then as you continue to innovate and you get to 80% and you get a few more details, file a second provisional, file a third provisional if necessary before you're, before you're ready for the expenditure of the full-blown utility application. Okay, thank you, Mick, and that's very important. Let me ask you one, one final question. Uh, when a person has obtained their uh, intellectual property, their patent certificate, their gold certificate for their wall from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, question comes up relative to what restrictions are there on transfer or licensing of any rights that a person has in that patent once they're perfected? Well, everything's negotiable, Greg. I mean, once we've obtained this right, we now have a legal right. As I've mentioned, it's the right to prevent other people from making or using this invention in the United States. Hopefully we've done things right in terms of if we have uh, more than one inventor, if we have two co-inventors, 
for, for reasons that I described earlier, if, if two different people contributed materially to the subject matter of different claims, then we've got two inventors. Hopefully, we've done something contractually to combine all those rights into one business entity. If we haven't, then we've created a real mess because two co-inventors with no contractual assignment each now have a 100% undivided right into that patent without accounting to each other. So now we've got two people out exploiting the same patent and competing against each other, which is a really crazy situation. But hopefully as the business owner, you've taken care of that and your business entity now owns it, not the individual inventors. And you can now exploit that patent right in terms of enforcing it and keeping your competition from competing against you. Uh, we can go sue them for patent infringement if they're infringing your patent. Certainly, uh, another opportunity is to license those rights. And that's again, is a contractual, contractual way of, of permitting other people uh, to, to practice your invention for a, for a royalty, for, for a uh, return on that uh, investment. Okay, well, thank you, Mick. And that's, that's all our uh, questions I've got for you. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and now we'll take questions uh, from the audience. Great. That was really good. That was our awesome. Time? Okay. You did good. You did good. Okay. I like didn't get that part about the provisional. What was that part about? <laughs> was that a provisional patent or a provisional? I'm sorry. I, just, I thought of things as I went along. So. See, that's where you and I have dealt out with each other a lot. So I only, what's coming now? Right? I only know of one really stupid thing I said. So I, I'll, I'll count that as a victory. <laughs>